Today on Uncommon Knowledge, the making of a political maverick. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation and the Star Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, a conversation with Senator John McCain. John McCain has spent a lifetime of service to this nation. Born to a distinguished naval family, he himself went on to spend 22 years as a naval aviator. In 1967, he was shot down over Vietnam and spent five and a half years as a prisoner of war, often subjected to torture. When McCain retired from the Navy in 1981, he settled in Arizona, served two terms in the House of Representatives, then won the Senate seat, once held by Barry Goldwater. Although a lifelong Republican, McCain has often broken with his party, earning himself a reputation with which he says he's not completely comfortable as a maverick. In 2000, McCain ran against George W. Bush for the Republican presidential nomination in a contest that was often bitter. Now John McCain has reflected on his lifetime of service in a new book, Worth the Fighting For. Russell Baker in the New York Review of Books, in a review of Worth the Fighting For, quote, McCain keeps saying that he remains a conservative, but this book does nothing to confirm it. It is the work of someone who has found out, rather late in life, who he is and what he truly believes, close quote. Senator, you have gone through half a dozen major life experiences. Why are you finding out, rather late in life, who you are and what you believe? Well, I'm not sure I totally agree with Russell Baker. I, You're allowed to bat the premise was, away if you out, want to. Yeah, I, was, I, I found out a lot of things when I, uh, sir, when I spent time in prison in Hanoi. Um, but I've learned a lot through the political process. And as I've tried to point out in the book, I learned from people that I respected and, and admired, uh, particularly in the political arena. Scoop Jackson was a very bipartisan person on national offense. Mo Udall I loved uh, as much as any person I've ever, as I've ever known. Barry Goldwater, very okay. independent and outspoken. So the, the let people me try to I've get a, admired. Yeah. Let me try to draw a beat okay. on your politics. All right. So in your book, you write that Teddy Roosevelt was your greatest political hero. You also write of Ronald Reagan, quote, no one had a more pronounced influence on my political convictions than Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it right there. TR is the progressive. He believed in activist government. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan is the classic conservative, skeptical of every step the government takes. How do you reconcile your admiration for those two? I think that what Ronald Reagan had was a sincerity and an honesty about his convictions. And at the same time, he, he, he is very pleasant to one and all, uh, the famous stories of him and Tip O'Neill, who was a left-wing liberal and he uh, a strong conservative that they used to fight all day and then have drinks and swap stories together in the evening. I admired Ronald Reagan for many things, including his role he played in winning the Cold War. Right. Strong, uh, his defense, uh, his support of a strong national defense, his national security positions, etc. And I do believe there was a time for Ronald Reagan. I believe that before Ronald Reagan there was excesses on the liberal side of government. Fiscal indiscipline, larger ever increasing role of government. Then I think perhaps we may have gone too far in the other direction. You admire Ronald Reagan, you admire Barry Goldwater. Set that to one side. Now listen to this. George Will one of your great fans, on the tobacco bill that you supported. You more than supported it. You were instrumental in seeing the passage of that bill. Quote, the tobacco bill was to compensate government, which actually makes money from smoking, by punishing a legal industry for selling legal products to people supposedly not responsible for the foolish decisions Joe Camel made them make. Close quote. Mm -hmm. All right, so would Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan have patted you on the back and said, John, well done about the tobacco bill? Uh, I think if they accepted the premise that this is a very harmful substance and enticing young people to use them, to use it, and using all kinds of different enticements to get them to, addicted to it, I think that at least they would have respected my point of view. Here's what I'm getting at. Teddy Roosevelt, Ronald Reagan, Goldwater, what you admire, 
this is one reading of your book, it's my reading so far, you can correct mm -hmm. me, is dynamism, animal vitality, goodness and bigness of heart, willingness to shake up the established order. Now what that makes you is a dynamic and interesting character, but not necessarily by any means a conservative. You gonna buy that? I, I have to say that I think that, that there are very legitimate ways of reading some of the things I've done that way, but I also view some of it as a process of maturation, a better understanding of some of the issues, and also the country changes, the country changes. I think Ronald Reagan was perfect for his time. We were having, we were not doing well in the Cold War. Uh, there, there were too much excesses of liberalism, certainly in my view in America, and he brought the pendulum back. I also believe there was a time for Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was a reformer because there was corruption in, in the land. If there hadn't been so much corruption, I'm not sure that Teddy Roosevelt, at least, he might have had the same feelings, but I don't think he would have succeeded. There was a time for ref, there was some time somebody came on the American scene to take on the robber barons. Okay. From robber barons, it's just a small step to the Charles Keating scandal. Charles Keating and the so-called Keating Five, four Democrats and John McCain, you write, I'm quoting you again. I would very much like to think that I have never been a man who, whose favor could be bought. From my earliest youth, I would have considered such a reputation to be the most shameful ignominy imaginable. Yet that is exactly how millions of Americans viewed me for a time a time that I will forever consider one of the worst experiences of my life." Close quote. Fill in the dots. Get us from the Keating scandal to your passionate embrace of campaign finance reform. I was always in favor of campaign finance reform. I worked with former Senator David Boren on, uh, on the issues, and I was always a reformer. I created the appearance of impropriety, as you just said, five senators meeting with regulators on behalf of a major contributor. I, I can't excuse it to you. I can tell you. I mean, I can't give you a good reason for it. I can give you lots of excuses and how I said I don't want any special favors for this guy and all that. But, but at the time, we created the appearance of impropriety. And at the time, it struck you as just the way things were done. I was very uncomfortable with it. But oh, I you did were it. uncomfortable with oh, it at the time. Oh yes, but but I did it. Doesn't matter whether I was uncomfortable. Or not. I did it. And uh, but it was it was uh, again something that probably was reinforced and in spades, and that is, it's not only what you do in politics, it's what you appear to do. So, like in campaign financing and big money donors, it's not only corruption, it's the appearance of corruption. So you come out of that experience, mm -hmm. and one of the thoughts you have is, doggone it, members of the Senate of the United States ought not to be put in a position like that. Or put themselves in a position like that, yes. All right, but those are two different arguments, Senator. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the first argument, the system ought not to put us in that position, mm -hmm. does, with a trip and a leap, lead to campaign finance reform. But the second argument, that the senators ought not to put themselves into that position themselves, mm -hmm. leads to saying, throw a bunch of those bums out and elect guys who don't behave that way. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And a lot of conservatives will say, wait a minute, we didn't need campaign finance reform. We needed a little old-fashioned rectitude. Well, I think that's true. But you see, I think the present system makes good people do bad things. It does. I think, yeah, I think that when the pharmaceutical companies in this last election uh, spent $20 million protecting by giving ads under the name of United Seniors or something like that, that this particular congressman or senator was in favor of real good uh, program for prescription drugs when they opposed a bill that would make generic drugs more accessible, then those people are beholden to the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. And the pharmaceutical industry there has, therefore has influence. When uh, the following events take place, uh, we have an amendment coming up, one by me and one by a Democrat, that says stock options should be expensed. A guy who contributed $760,000 to the Democratic Party picks up the phone and calls the Democrat majority leader and says, I don't want that to pass. McCain brings up the amendment. The amendment is blocked from being voted on. Then the Democrat brings up a similar amendment, and the Republican leadership blocks that amendment from ever being voted on. And everybody knows. When I say everybody, Alan Greenspan, Warren Buffett, and Paul Volcker believe that stock options ought to be treated as an expense. Whose interests were being served then? The, the, the rich guys in Silicon Valley? The guys like Larry Ellison that cashed in $734 million in stock options in one year while the, st while the stock went in the tank and they laid off people? 
or, or what was his interest served or were the interests of the American people and his employees served? You do a pretty good Theodore Roosevelt, Senator. <laughs> you are pretty good at that. Let me stay on Let me propose another approach to this campaign finance problem. Less regulation, not more. Here's a proposal I'll put to you, and you tell me what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Anybody ought to be able to give any amount of money to any candidate he wants as long as it's made public on the internet within 24 hours. So in the two, 2000 election, Colin Powell or John McCain could have called a press conference, stood in front of 20 people, all of their faces on camera, and said, ladies and gentlemen, each of these people behind me has donated $1 million to my campaign. I'm running for president. I promise no special favors to them, and I invite you to watch me. What would have been wrong with that? That is then based on the premise of the opponents of campaign finance reform that money is free speech. The United right. States Supreme Court has said money is not free speech, money is property. If you accept that money is free speech, then the richest and wealthiest powerful influences in America then have the megaphone and average citizens without money are sitting in the back and not heard. And that's exactly the way it is today. So you're confident. Yeah that when, you're, when McCain Feingold makes its way to the United States Supreme Court, as it no doubt mm -hmm. will, yes, we, they're not going to gut it? I uh, believe that they will not. I'm not positive, uh, particularly about some provisions of the bill, the so-called snow Jeffords Amendment, which prevents six, 30 days before a primary and 60 days before a general that, uh, that advertisements be run that are funded by unlimited amounts of money. In other words, restricts the amount of money. And let me just clarify one thing for you, sure. really. Please. It has never been held anything but constitutional. There's a limit on the amount of money that I can raise. I, I, no matter how much you support me, according to the law, and the new law now, it used to be 1000 Now, you can only give me $2,000 for my primary and $2,000 for my general election. Right. But these outside interests now, even though there's laws on the books that say, it's, not, it's against the law for corporate contributions and union contributions. Mm -hmm. Those people are able to exploit loopholes and get unlimited contributions. Somebody wants to give some corporation or some union $10 million and funnel it into my campaign, they can. So what we've done in this law is say, no, if you want to give, you corporation and you, you uh, union want to give money, then you can only give it in the same amounts of money that individuals are allowed to give money to McCain. You've lived a long and interesting life, and I want to move on to other topics, but let me take one last on this campaign finance reform. I'd like to quote to you yep. Nelson Polsby, one of the nation's leading political scientists mm -hmm. who is an astute uh, a student of Congress and a Democrat. So this isn't a conservative attack. Mm -hmm. Here's what Nelson Polsby said on this program not long ago, quote, the trouble with attacking soft money, McCain Feingold he's talking about, is that it attacks the political parties. It doesn't mean that if the political parties are no longer to allowed to gather money, money will not be expended. It'll be expended as independent expenditures by PACs. What's at stake is that the pattern of expenditures by parties is earlier on and on winnable elections, but not necessarily won seats. PACs pattern of expenditure is late and on incumbents. So if you want enhanced political competition, then you'll be against the regulation of soft money, close quote. There's a political scientist and a Democrat. Well, Mr. Polsby uh, probably has uh, either not paid attention to or uh, deliberately ignores the fact that we have more incumbents elected under the present system as it grows worse and worse, kept in office than ever before. So Mr. Polsby, why is it on the present system that, that of 435 House seats, there was like, 15, 20 that were competitive. Okay. Part of it is redistricting. Yeah, the gerrymandering, but isn't part that? Of, part no. of it is redistricting. The other part is that none of them are vulnerable. They make themselves invulnerable. Of 34 Senate seats, how come only five or six were competitive and, and changed hands? And whereas in 1980s, when I first started running for office, there was no such thing as soft money. And guess what? We used to have to go out and knock on doors, have armies of volunteers, have set up phone banks. Uh, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. Now, the whole game is get as much money as you can and run as many attack ads against your opponent as you can. And Mr. Polsby, Teddy Roosevelt in 1907 got corporate contributions outlawed. Why? Because, cor because the robber barons were, were uh, controlling American elections. In 1947, we outlawed union contributions. Those laws are still on the books. Why are they doing what they're doing? They're doing it because they found loopholes and a federal election commission, which is absolutely outrageous, has opened those loopholes so they can be in violation of existing law. Is McCain-Feingold? On to a new topic, foreign policy. 
beginning with a little not-so-ancient history. October 19, 1994, Clinton administration announces its agreement mm -hmm. with North Korea. And John McCain says, and I quote you, this is not your book, but I'm quoting you to yourself. Mm -hmm. On at least eight previous occasions, North Korea has lied to the Clinton administration. With this agreement, administrations, administration officials have willingly acquiesced in Pyongyang's almost certain further deception. Yet again, the administration has mistaken resolving the North Korean nuclear crisis with merely postponing its apogee. Close quote. Why did the President of the United States and his great big foreign policy apparatus miss what you saw? I think that there was an understandable desire to avoid a confrontation, number one. I think there was the same argument that uh, was used in the 1930s against the British government of Neville Chamberlain, although certainly the stakes weren't as high as they, are, uh, as they were then. And I think also that uh, the North Koreans were pretty clever in how they did it. And as much as I admire former President Carter, and I do for his post-presidency uh, behavior. Very and, fine, former uh, president. Uh, yeah, his post-presidency behavior has been wonderful. He, paid, he played a big role, too. He flew to Pyongyang right. and met with them, and, and then came out and said, everything is going to be fine. Yeah, these people, their record showed that they would not be telling the truth. Was and they it would wishful continue. thinking? or shrewd political calculation that that was a can they just wanted to kick down the road and let somebody else deal with later? I have to believe that it was, uh, it was a good faith effort, that they were just deceived. I don't think they intentionally kicked the can down the road. These, these men, uh, and I don't know of any woman who was involved in that uh, at that particular time, uh, are honorable people who were patriotic. I just think they, they're guilty of gross misjudgment. Okay. Another episode in the Clinton years. Five months after the ambush of U.S. Army Rangers in Mogadishu, George mm -hmm. Bush, the elder, sends troops in on a humanitarian mission to Somalia. Mm -hmm. Clinton takes office. Some of our Rangers get killed in Mogadishu. Clinton orders the troops home. Now, 11 days after that ambush, that is some months before he orders the troops home, John McCain sponsors a piece of legislation in the Senate calling for the prompt and orderly withdrawal of our forces. In his book, John McCain writes, somewhere in the Sudan, Osama bin Laden observed our withdrawal from Somalia and concluded that America no longer had the stomach for war. Mm -hmm. You have changed your position on reflection. Uh, the Clinton administration did right, did wrong. What I'm, I'm, I'm willing mm -hmm. to give uh, sure. you the benefit of yeah. hindsight. Mm -hmm. Did you miss Osama bin Laden? Did the Clinton administration, did everybody miss it? Should we have known more than we did at the time? All of us should have known more than we did at the time, but in the particular case of Somalia, we went in there under the auspices of the UN, not the United States of America, right. and the purpose was to feed hungry people. Then the United Nations, with American and a retired Navy Admiral, decided that we would go warlord hunting. And then the attitude of the people towards the military forces in the area went from welcoming to one of, of outright hostility to the point where they were going on in these kidnapping missions. And then, and, and also there was a request from the Secretary of Defense of the United States to send more and better equipment with which to protect our troops. That was turned down. That, that, that request was rejected. So therefore, when the crisis came, they didn't have the equipment necessary. They had to borrow tanks from... I think it was the Egyptians that they finally had to borrow tanks from in order to go in and finally get uh, our people out. It was a classic case of mission creep, and that's why it was time to get out of there, because the original mission of feeding hung hungry people had failed, and then the mission it had morphed into of kidnapping warlords is just a crazy cockamamie idea in a place like Mogadishu. And you, you see, that's, that why, that's why I wanted us out. Look, look at the example of Bosnia. Uh, early on, broadly speaking, you supported yeah. Clinton in in in, in, the, in Yugoslavia and Bosnia. Yes, right? I, di I okay. did. But the problem in Bosnia, it was a United Nations operation to start with. One of the most terrible embarrassments, scandals in history, was the Dutch UN soldiers in Srebrenica, and the and the uh, the Serbian general comes in. They clink glasses, having a drink. Meanwhile, the Serbian troops are taking thousands of men, women, and children out, ethnic cleansing, raping, and murdering them. 
but because the Dutch uh, colonel did not have the military force to stop the Serbians from doing it. When it went from a United Nations mission to a NATO mission, that's when things became uh, effectively carried out. And yes, I supported those, and I think the United States is very correct in stopping genocide and acts of, of incredible inhumanity wherever they take place. So what would John McCain put on Bill Clinton's foreign policy report card? Give William Jefferson Clinton a grade as commander-in-chief. I'd, I'd probably give him a C to a B, and let me tell you why. He played a very key role in the Irish uh, peace process. He played a, a marvelous role there. He had it doesn't bother you that that's unraveled lately? Uh, no, because I think they've good. gone too far. I think it'll still right. be recovered. Right. Uh, I think that uh, he uh, developed very good relations with our European allies. I think he was helpful in NATO, uh, but I think in other areas he... he my problem with Bill Clinton was that he was so feckless. He didn't ever focus his time and attention completely on foreign policy issues because Bill Clinton needed instant gratification. And, and th this, this made him not have a very steadfast approach, which other great presidents have in my view. All right, now grade another commander in chief mm -hmm. who by my reading has shown considerably more focus, George mm -hmm. W. Bush, mm -hmm. give him a grade since September 11th? A. A. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a minus. Let me say A minus. The, right. the, the minus. That, that A, we couldn't let that yeah. stand. The minus, the minus is that he has not perhaps followed the dictum of Teddy Roosevelt about talking softly and carrying a big stick. We've got to be much less aggressive in that we, we want to be much less confrontational with our allies. Time magazine, you wrote recently, quote, Change must also, this is not just Iraq, change must also come to Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, Iran, the Palestinian Authority, and wherever nations are ordered to exalt the few at the expense of the many. Close quote. Senator, how big a war do you want? I don't, I don't mean that we act militarily. I mean that we should absolutely insist with our economic, cultural, diplomatic, and every other superiority that nations make progress towards the realization of the rights of all human beings on this earth, no matter where they live. And for the Saudis to spend their money to, on the madrasas who take kids off the street and teach them the hate and destruction of Western values and civilization, to me, is unconscionable. And I think as long as there's a million young men standing on street corners with worry beads, with no hope, no job, no democracy, no opportunity, you're going to have acts of terror because they're going to breed them. And is that a message proper to a member of the United States Senate, but not necessarily to the president? That is to say, if he'd be rattling everybody all over the Middle East if he signed on to that quotation saying we want dramatic change in Saudi Arabia, Iran, I, Egypt. Look, I'm, I'm not even saying dramatic change. I think, well, the Saudis, why don't we start out by letting a woman ride in the front seat of a car? You know, that would be a major breakthrough. I, I'm saying that we are dominant, not just militarily. You can't force a country militarily I'd, uh, unless they pose a threat to the United States of America. But what you can do is you can uh, exercise a lot of, a lot of, a tremendous amount of influence uh, on their people. We have every right to expect progress in Saudi Arabia. We have every right to expect progress in Egypt. We're giving the Egyptians two billion dollars a year. And has the administration done an adequate job of holding it to it? No. Holding them to it? No. No. But I do believe... Time for some final thoughts from John McCain on his lifetime of public service. We've talked a little bit at the beginning about contradictions in your character, or at least yeah. in your political life. You spent five and a half years of your life as a POW, mm -hmm. going through things that haven't, don't even care to describe to my children, don't like mm -hmm. to imagine. I don't know how you did it. And anytime you want me to shine your shoes, believe me, <laughs> I will. But that didn't turn you into a pacifist. On the contrary, throughout your political career, I have to say on domestic policy, I can't quite figure out the consistency in McCain's <laughs> record. But on foreign policy and on defense, you have been a rock. How do you square those two? You, you don't regret what you went through? Mm -hmm. You're able to, do, do you feel it gives you moral authority? No, I, I feel I have no more moral authority than any other elected official. I do have the benefit of experience and study over an entire lifetime and talking to the smartest people in the world. Having the privilege of sitting down with people like Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski and Lee Kuan Yew and a whole lot of smart people in this world. 
Uh, but you see, my role model, Teddy Roosevelt, had this sense of America's greatness, and America was a better world. He's the one that saw the potential for America in the 20th century. And I believe, and I don't compare myself favorably with Theodore Roosevelt, but I see the sense of America's greatness. We've reached the stage in the world where we can be the greatest force for good. And we were founded on the noblest principles. We don't want to take over any of these countries. We're not interested in an American empire, but we are interested in the furtherance of the fundamental human rights that we are blessed with in the United States of America. And therefore, we, are the, we have the potential to do it, and therefore, we should continue that. And you can't do it without, from time to time, as rarely as possible, acting militarily. Senator, it's television, alas, so we've got to wrap it up. Okay. Claire Booth Luce is famous for having remarked that history gives no man more than one sentence. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Winston Churchill faced down Hitler. Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. What sentence would you like history to give to John McCain? He served his country. Senator, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.